Kulkarni Stock. Dr. Manisham Kulkarni is a senior scientific officer at Center for Nanosciences, IIT Kanpur. He completed his PhD in physics at Shivaji University, Kolhapur. He then completed his postdoc research first at IIT Kanpur and then at the University of Akron, USA. He also worked as a guest researcher at National Institute of Standards and Technology, Gaithersburg, MD, USA. His area of specialization and expertise is in self-assembly and organization in thin polymer films for micro and nano patterning, nano bio platforms for early detection of pathogens and drug testing, SCRS active materials, combinatorial synthesis and gradient field processing of thin polymer films, phase transitions and orientation control in block copolymers films for high fidelity nanoscale patterns and their studies by neutron and high energy X-ray beams, Sol gel aerosol processing, organic gel and photoresist based films, organic photovoltaic blended films. He has published more than 80 research articles in peer reviewed international journals. He also has two Indian patents and two book chapters. So let's welcome Dr. Manisham Kulkarni to enlighten her, us with his presentation on the topic physical, physiochemical functional nanomaterials and their application. Manish, please unmute. Manish, you have to unmute. Yes. Thank you, Sony, for this nice introduction. Uh, first of all, congratulations to the Carbon Lab. Uh, you have done some excellent work, uh, especially Professor Chandrasekhar Sharma. I'm very happy to call you Professor Chandrasekhar Sharma. <laughs> and you have done some excellent work in last 10 years. Uh, it's a great achievement that what you have done, as Rabbi rightly said. In fact, all, all the colleagues that we had at IIT Kanpur, I'm very happy to see what they have achieved in just 10 years. It's great. So let's start. I'll start my presentation. Uh, I'll be talking on physical chemical functional nanomaterials and their applications. As soon as I came to know that uh, Professor Ravi Prata is going to talk on divetting, I removed all divetting slides <laughs> because I know he is an expert, world world known expert uh, now on divetting. So uh, I tried to skip divetting slides from my presentation, and I have kept the other work that I have done in the last uh, couple of years or maybe more than that uh, in this work. So this is the outline of my talk. Uh, so we'll first talk about some uh, properties of surface and uh, specific surface area, uh, what kind of uh, physical functionalization, chemical functionalization is, uh, some case studies that we have done uh, at uh, Center for Nanosciences and other places that I have been working on in the last 10-15 uh, years and then we'll summarize. It will be a short talk. I will not bore you to death too much for too much time. And I have tried to keep no equations in this, in this presentation so that you will not be bored much. So let's start with this quote. This quote, very famous quote from Wolfgang and Pauli, uh, who says, God made the bulk and the surfaces were invented by the devil. Precisely because the at these due to imbalance of forces at this interface, uh, the properties at the surface change drastically for liquids and solids. So, for example, in water, if you consider a molecule setting it the bulk, it experiences probably equal amount of repulsion or attractive forces from all sides. Whereas a molecule setting on the top surface uh, in contact with air or other atmosphere, the, the forces are imbalanced. So it will be having more attractive forces or repulsive forces from the uh, inside of the bulb than the interface. So that leads to very uh, uh, beautiful phenomena of surface tension. So as you can see, one uh, a straddler is uh, straddling on a uh, water just because of the surface tension of the water. So it is unable to break the of the film of this water and it remains stable even on water surface. It can walk on water. 
So there is another interesting phenomena, uh, especially for nanomaterials, it's very important to understand is the specific surface area. And that is not very intuitive uh, when you look at small uh, size or uh, nanoscale materials. That uh, if you go on uh, reducing the size, you start say breaking up a cube of a material into small pieces and you go on doing that multiple times, you, will, uh, you are going to increase the specific surface area, which is units of surface area divided by one unit of mass tremendously. And there, that, what it means is that there are a lot of uh, number of molecules sitting on a surface for, a uh, for any given substrate or sub uh, material are much, much larger as compared to uh, the in inside the bulk. So this leads to very interesting properties as Rabi Prata showed some of, uh, in some of his slides. That just because of this, uh, the cold nanoparticle change colors drastically from uh, one, uh, one size to other size just because of these phenomena, because there are a large, large number of uh, atoms that are coming in contact with the surface. And then as soon as they come on the surface, their property change. They, they completely exhibit different properties at the surface. So that leads to uh, us to nanoscale materials. So where, uh, as Rivita has already mentioned some of these, uh, at least one dimension of the pattern or material is smaller than a few hundreds of nanometer. So that leads to uh, very different, altogether different properties than the bulk counterpart. So there are different ways of uh, making these nanomaterials. Uh, some of them, Rabi uh, has already talked about the self-assembly where these small molecules assemble in one particular fashion or uh, other on substrate or given uh, area in a given volume due to their chemical properties. Whereas there is also a template patterning where you can do lithographic or some other tool like micro machining, and then you can break a bigger part uh, material into a smaller material and you get a nano scale or micro scale material. So what are the advantages of this uh, self-assembly? As uh, you can see that since you don't have uh, to add any new instrument, these are very less tedious processes. It's a cost effective. There is no fancy equipment needed. But as Rabi showed that there, that there are some uh, areas where, uh, where you will not get a very long range order in these patterns. So you, you are used, forced to use some kind of directed patterning or some template to direct them or to organize them in a special way. Whereas in lithographic processes, they are very reliable. You get long range order, they are tedious. But again, the limitation is that uh, you cannot have a very large area pattern simultaneously on, on these kits. So these are some of the nanoscale nanofabrication methods uh, that we use regularly, that electron beam lithography or focus ion beam, dip pen lithography, etc. Most of, I think you uh, have used some of these at some point of time in your research. Uh, these are parallel processes and these are serial processes where you can simultaneously expose large amount of area of substrate or sample uh, to uh, UV light or some other radiation and you can uh, get uh, large area pattern, whereas serial processes are slower. But these uh, parallel processes tend to have large, more defects as compared to serial processes. But it's a very slow and a very expensive process and it takes a lot of time. So let's come to now func uh, surface functionalization. So there are two aspects of surface functionalization. One is chemical functionalization. So let's say you have a silane layer uh, on a glass and you expose it to UV ozone treatment, uh, you, you can make it, uh, make the hydrophobic surface to hydrophilic one. Now here, I'm showing here uh, one example that we did in our lab is that we exposed, uh, we first coated a silane layer uh, on top of a glass. So that makes it hydrophobic because of this alkane chain, long alkane chain sitting on at the uh, top. And when you expose this, uh, uh, surface to a UV ozone radiation. However, there was a trick when we expose it, we change the velocity, we move the substrate through a UV ozone chamber and we moved it in a gradient way. So it, initially it was very slow, 
then it was very fast. So we changed the velocity of the uh, radiation, meaning that we changed the exposure time. So uh, depending on the exposure the amount of exposure time, the glass becomes uh, remains more hydrophobic or less hydrophobic, depending on the uh, exposure. So if, if the glass moved very quickly, so for example, if here the glass was moving very fast, so the uh, most of the alkyl chain remains intact. So the glass remains hydrophobic and you can see the droplet is moving, uh, has moved considerably downwards. Whereas in this case, the glass was exposed maximum. So the droplet is not moving very fast. So it is sticking. It has become completely hydrophilic and the glass, uh, the drop remains completely stuck to the glass in this case. Uh, so this is uh, one example of chemical functionalization. Similarly, you can also do physical patterning, say topographical patterning using some lithographic or self uh, soft lithography or hard lithography, whatever you want, uh, micro machining. So let's, uh, some examples we have seen already uh, from the first presenter where she used a PDMS stamp to make pattern substrates. So similarly, you can use a pat pattern stamp and make a pattern substrate out of PDMS or any soft matter, uh, soft material like soft polymer. And you can get a very nicely pattern uh, polymer or substrate, uh, other kind of substrate. Similar examples already exist in nature where you see a uh, lotus leaf, it has very uh, different topographic features on the top side versus bottom side. So on the top side, you see a very big tall pillars, whereas at the bottom side, it has a very uh, not so tall, very small pillars, and that, that leaves so very different weighting properties at the top and the bottom side of the leaf. So, of course, nature is doing this uh, game. Is it, uh, nature is in this game for a long time now. Uh, we are still very new to this all functionalization and uh, uh, tricks that nature already has its, uh, its slave. Uh, so here are some examples where people have tried to mimic the nature, which are very interesting to see. That's why I just included here this slide. So for example, here, this is a concrete, uh, which mimics the uh, rock formation or rocky reefs inside the uh, sea. So what it helps, it helps the, uh, if you mimic the uh, reef structure on a concrete, what they have observed is that it allows the growth of marine life easily on these concrete structures. So for example, if you want to build something in the sea, you should not disturb the biodiversity of uh, the life in the sea, marine life in the sea. So it will allow those that marine life to grow easily on such kind of concrete structures. So this is of course on my, my macro scale. This example, next example is on a micro scale where this is a particular uh, uh, rodent it lives in a uh, very uh, dry desert. It's a lizard. Uh, so it's called Texas for lizard. It doesn't get, it doesn't have access to water. So what it does is it has hydrophilic hairs on top of its skin. And the microstructure is designed in such a way that any sweat or any dew that accumulates on the top of uh, its skin it slowly migrates towards its move, uh, mouth. So it gets access to the water, not from any other source, but or from its own sweat and uh, dew in the air. So this is very useful for humid conditions. We have in India uh, such humid conditions almost throughout the year. And we have a uh, scarcity of water in most of the places because it's very dry or uh, there is no water resource nearby. So if we can mimic such kind of structure to collect water from our air, this will be very useful for our environment. This is another example uh, where uh, uh, the aim was to collect plastic pollution from marine uh, life, uh, so from the sea bed. There is a lot of plastic currently going on sea, but how to collect it? So they have mimicked, uh, this is a, uh, manta ray and it has a special mechanism to capture its prey. So it has a rib-like structure in its mouth where it just caught, uh, catches the fish and the water flows away from its uh, 
uh, results. So similarly, if you have a structure, we'll be making this kind of uh, mentor is, uh, 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 structures, then you move this uh, structure through the C, uh, through the C, and then you, you will automatically capture a lot of sea waste, uh, plastic waste in these kind of uh, bags. This is another example where uh, a macro scale uh, phenomena was used to reduce these kind of bullet trains, uh, the, the resistance of these bullet trains. Uh, Ravi probably has gone there and uh, has traveled through this bullet train as well, where this bullet train has a special beak like structure at the top, uh, at the engine side. And this reduces uh, the air pressure considerably when this train is traveling through a tunnel. And that reduces, uh, because initially they had a big problem where whenever this train traveled, because of this uh, pressure created at the uh, forefront of this train, there was a big sound coming out of the system. And that troubled the neighborhood completely. And they, they were scared by that sound. But once they designed this, uh, change this design of the uh, design of the engine to this beak like structure the pressure drop uh, come uh, pressure drop considerably and uh, there was no sound at all when when the train traveled through the tunnel so this is a very unique example uh, where we have directly copied a nature uh, a case to a practical use so we have of course uh, done some uh, work at uh, uh, this biomimicking at CNS. So some of the examples that I'm just going to show here, I will not discuss uh, except for this, I will not discuss other examples right now, but we have done some work uh, uh, regarding this biomimicics that I can do. So first work that I'm going to talk about is uh, regarding SARS sensor. So SARS is, some of you may not, uh, may be new to this field, so I'm just going to explain a little bit. It's a called surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, the short form is SERS. So as you know, Raman spectroscopy is an excellent finger marker, uh, fingerprint marker for many of the organic molecules. So it is very useful tool to detect organic moieties in your sample or uh, the sample of interest. However, the other problem with this is uh, the signal amplitude is significantly low for Raman signal. So the, the so if you have, but, but it was observed that if you have some of the metallic nanoparticles like gold or silver in vicinity of your organic molecule, uh, there is a considerable enhancement of the signal uh, in this uh, Raman spectroscopy. So this was very uh, useful finding. So now uh, people have started to work on uh, adding nanoparticles and other uh, materials like graphene, they have you know, particularly observed that graphene is very useful for uh, increasing the ACRS intensity. And we have done some work on this uh, uh, ACRS, uh, developing new ACRS type sensor, and I will explain a little bit about them. So there are two different ampli amplification mechanisms uh, that contribute for Raman inten intensity enhancement. Uh, first is electromagnetic enhancement, where uh, the surface charge, uh, so Ravi was talking about uh, SPR signal. Uh, so that SPR, uh, surface plasma resonance, contributes greatly to, in enhancing the intensity of this Raman uh, uh, spec, uh, signal. And other is chemical enhancement. As I said, uh, if you add graphene uh, or uh, graphene-like structures in near vicinity to the uh, these nanoparticles and uh, the analyte to be observed, then it was observed that the charge transfer becomes very easy uh, depending on the material. So in some cases, there is a chemical enhancement and uh, most of the cases it is both electromagnetic as well as chemical enhancement that contributes to the increase in uh, Raman intensity. And this is collectively called as SERS or surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. So a properly functionalized ACR substrate can detect a trace level, uh, which is pico or femtomolar concentration of molecules. So this is very useful tool. So we try to develop uh, such uh, system where uh, our ultimate aim is to develop a point of care device. 
uh, to detect various diseases. So currently we have seen that these, uh, since our, uh, this COVID has started, uh, it took uh, almost five months to increase our daily testing capacity to 50,000 samples. That was largely because we are still heavily dependent on other countries for testing kits and components. We don't have indigenous testing kits and uh, which are portable and handy uh, right now at, at our disposal. So we need to have, uh, we need to develop an alternative eco uh, healthcare ecosystem uh, where we can do, uh, we can detect such diseases very quickly and it should be also cost effective and uh, portable, especially considering that more majority of our population lives in a rural area which doesn't have access to most of the health facilities that city or urban population has. So one, so we propose that probably this CRS based uh, selective sensor uh, could be one such tool uh, that can detect at least few of these diseases. And we are trying to develop a couple of them uh, right now at uh, IIT Kanpur. We have already seen that uh, the, the limit of detection is about 10 to to minus 15 uh, with our device. So which is uh, almost like a femtomolar uh, case for some of these analytes, uh, which are some of these are explosive uh, analytes because we had some projects with DRDO where they wanted to have this detection of explosives at a very low or uh, trace level molecule. Uh, we also have some tested done or uh, some ongoing work is also uh, there on these. Uh, biomarkers such as uric acid, where we can detect the uric acid uh, at the nanomolar level. So depending on uh, the binding uh, chemistry that we use, we can uh, detect various different analytes using the same sensor. So this is one example uh, where this uh, SARS sensor was especially used for detection of explosive. So this is a uh, dinitrotoluene uh, is a specific marker for uh, uh, explosive. We tried to uh, develop a sensor. Uh, this was a, uh, so initially we took a silver sheet and it was mic a micro machine or pattern using a laser. And this laser, uh, ablates the silver and what we observed that this is the original uh, sheet which was not non ablated and when we uh, pattern it using a laser the depending on the, uh, the power of the laser which was varied from uh, different uh, power scales and the time that we expose the silver uh, sheet to it we can get various different depths and widths of these uh, nanostructures uh, microstructures actually. So the other interesting phenomena that happens simultaneously was that as we are ablating the silver from this, it has to go somewhere. And what is what is doing is that in, uh, once the laser ablates the silver, uh, knocks out the silver atoms, they deposit in the vicinity of this pattern. So we try to exploit that and we try to vary the uh, width and depth of these patterns and we check where the silver is depositing and whether these nanoparticles, silver nanoparticles depositing in the vicinity can enhance the SAR signal considerably. And indeed, what we found that depending on the laser energy and uh, uh, the depth and ablated width was changed. And depending on where uh, the molecules are sitting, if they are sitting near the vicinity of these uh, nanoparticles, ablated nanoparticles uh, sitting at the top surface, the, the Raman enhancement was significant as compared to region two where uh, it's in the middle of the two ablated region where there are minimum number of part, uh, silver particles sitting. Uh, the, the enhancement was very less as compared to uh, adjacent to the ablation region. So this uh, the, and we found that the enhancement, uh, we calculated the enhancement factor as well, which was close to 10 to 15 or something, so which is very good for uh, their press detection. 
Similarly, we have done uh, more work on the SCRS using micro patterning, on using chemical synthesis, as well as electrospinning. So currently, we what we are trying to do is uh, we are trying to electrospun uh, graphitizing and non-graphitizing carbon. And what we see is that the graphitizing carbon leads to much much higher intensity uh, enhancement as compared to non-graphitizing carbon. And we are about to publish that work very soon. This is the second example. Uh, this is a very old example from my postdoc days, uh, but it's very interesting because here uh, we changed the both physical and chemical properties of the substrate and observed its effect on the orientation of block copolymers. So these block copolymers are nothing but uh, two uh, immiscible polymers joined together by a covalent bond. So this is called diblock copolymer. If there are three, then it's called tri-block copolymer and more and so on. So if, if these two uh, diblock copolymers, they are thermally heated or exposed to solvent vapor, uh, what happens is that they tend to phase segregate. Now this phase segregation typically occurs on a very small scale, which is in nanometer scale. Now, if we can exploit that nanometer scale for some of the applications like uh, for example, here I have shown one example from Hitachi Global Storage Technologies where they have developed a magnetic media patterning uh, device. This is it's a storage device where uh, they use a block of polymer film and phase separated it and etched out one of the uh, blocks from the selective uh, selectively from this uh, film and exposed the magnetic and filled it with the magnetic material. And that magnetic material, uh, it acts as a storage media now. And this has a capacity of one terabyte uh, in per, per square inch. So it's a very high storage capacity considering it's only one square inch in size. So this, this is one example where block polymer can be direct, uh, has been directly used for developing such a device. But for that, what we what needs to be done is that we need to have access to the both of the phases. As Ravi Bhatta was showing in one example where the, uh, the blend was sitting on top of each other and there was a lamellar kind of structure. If they are sitting on top of each other, we are exposed, uh, we are uh, seeing only top, uh, top level polymer uh, at the surface, on the top surface. But if we have a vertical orientation, Way, like shown here, where there is one PS phase and the other is PMM phase, and we selectively etch out this PMM phase, we can get a very nicely, uh, a nice, uh, we can get nice patterns in uh, substrate or polymer film, and we can have a very large area. That is the big, biggest advantage of block copolymer, that you get a very large area simultaneously pattern on nanoscale which is very difficult to do using any of the existing techniques right now in, in the world. Even by E-beam or deep U ultra UV lithography, it's very difficult to obtain such kind of structures on a very large area scale. So this is the biggest advantage block polymer has. And if we can control the orientation of this block polymer, that is the biggest uh, challenge to control it and to have this kind of orientation on top of each other. So for example, I've shown here, this, this is what typically a block of polymer film looks like. And they, these are lamellae. So red and blue are two different phases of the polymer. And they sit on top of each other. Typically, this is called a, a horizontal orientation. But if we can flip them like this, then this is called a vertical orientation. And we can selectively then etch out one of these phases and make use of this patterning uh, tool. Uh, for developing uh, the patterning template for developing new devices. So this is uh, one of the work uh, that Karim initiated a uh, long time back, where he was just seeing effect of surface energy on the orientation of block polymers. Where you can see that at the V means vertical orientation, H means horizontal orientation. The V is the region where the block polymer is oriented vertically and H is the region where the block polymer is oriented horizontally. So this is one example of how the surface energy uh, can be used 
for changing the orientation of block polymer in uh, these films however the limitation is that the films has to be very very small thinner films so this is what typically uh, block polymer phase diagram looks like uh, if you have 50 50% uh, equal amount of polymers to two different polymers uh, then you have a uh, lamellar kind of uh, phase phases in the block polymer so this is what we are using right now so the motivation for our work was to try to find out uh, actually if apart from the surface energy can roughness of the substrate also help in orientating these block polymer films vertically so that was our motivation so this was the or original paper that we were following uh, this was by seva savani et al where they had shown that if the surface roughness of the the substrate is above a particular value this is called critical value then they uh, they have shown that the lamellae orient vertically uh, no matter what however then there were some subsequent publication that contradicted their own results so we were trying to final uh, find out what exactly uh, actually contributes to the orientation of these block of polymers whether it has to be a neutral surface whether it has to be hierarchically rough or if this condition is sufficient so then we uh, went on developing a new method for changing the roughness of the substrate uh, so this this was my original uh, phd work where i was using tetraethyl orthosilicate for making aerogels so i was I, i thought that maybe i will use this uh, uh, knowledge and then make rough substrates out of this so now you can see that just by changing the concentration of catalyst and uh, aging time we can uh, we can have a great control over the roughness of these films also i am adding a trimethylsilane layer so which will give a, a hydrophobicity so it will be also a neutral layer Uh, so both these polymers won't like that layer so they will remain neutral to this substrate so so we can simultaneously now vary the roughness so as you can see the roughness is about 0.5 and here it's about 2 and then uh, this is about 30 39 so you can now increasingly vary the roughness as well as the surface energy by just exposing it to uh, uv you can change the surface energy as well so we did that using a flow coating so using a flow coating i will just just try to run this so this is what a typical flow coating is going to look like so this is a glass blade which is shown here and then it has uh, so this pipe where the liquid is flowing and then i am coating this liquid on top of a substrate and you can see that the the film is formed now i can change the speed of this so the i can change the speed of this blade and depending on the blade velocity you will get thinner or thicker film so count count uh, contrasting to with the uh, the common spinning that we use where we have at higher rpm thinner films here actually you get thicker films at higher velocity that is because liquids are incompressible so the blade skips lot of liquid uh, behind and that's why you get thicker films at a higher velocity and also if you are so there's a then you have a gradient thin film thickness along this way and then if you expose orthogonally uh, this substrate to a uh, uv or uh, uv ozone uh, kind of tube then you can also change the surface energy along this direction and thickness along this direction so in one sample i can generate more than 1000 of data points and that is very useful for such experiments where even a small change in thickness or small change in surface energy can greatly affect your outcome so this is a very useful tool to have so that can generate a library of samples on a single substrate so you are keeping all these conditions identical so this is what it looks like so the thickness will be varying in this direction so i varied the thickness from 25 to 150 nanometer in one direction and the surface substrate energy was varied from 29 millijoules to 
70 milliliters. So the substrate was initially exposed to UV and then the films were coated on top. So, and then we had this hydrophobic propyl ligands on top of it. And that once they are exposed to this uh, UV uh, ozone, then you can change the surface mode. So then we observed using AFM as well as uh, neutron scattering, the uh, structures that we were, uh, the orientation of these block of polymers and try to see where, what we get. So as you can see here, uh, these are vertically oriented uh, phases. So most of the area here, you see vertical orientation. Whereas as you go along the thickness, the, the orientation, vertical oriented region becomes smaller and smaller. And here you get completely horizontal orientation. And again, as you go along the thicker side, and again, you see some flipping of uh, the orientation. So you get some vertical orientation and some uh, regions with horizontal orientation and so on. And then we actually, uh, because AFM is a very uh, surface phenomenon, so that can, uh, that has access only to the surface of the film. We actually use neutron scattering to uh, detect the inside of the film and uh, found that indeed the, uh, the, the vertical orientation uh, is there uh, wherever we see this vertical orientation on the top of the surface. Then we also use the X-ray uh, scattering, uh, this is called grazing incidence, small angle X-ray scattering, uh, where you can also get such kind of uh, X-ray scattering patterns from the, uh, depending on the orientation of the films to detect the internal structure of the film. So from both these methods, we confirm that the, the orientation is what it is seen in uh, AFM. So it's not only a surface phenomena, but also a bulk phenomena. And then what we interestingly observed that the roughness is not, uh, not a very uh, important factor. In fact, most important factor is the factor dimension of the substrate. So as you can see, this 30 nanometer is the most uh, rough film that we had. However, only a fraction of uh, that uh, film had uh, actually shows vertical orientation. Whereas even for a uh, five nanometer rough film with a very high fractal dimension of 2.5 or 2.6, you get almost 100% vertical orientation in such kind of on such kind of subsystem. So we conclude that the periodic surface is not the only necessity. Roughness helps in vertical orientation, but it's not all only sufficient. The factor dimension is a more critical uh, factor, and so the factor the higher the factor dimension, you get better vertical orientation. And why it is because because the polymer if it has to orient horizontally on such a substrate, it is easy for it for a low fractal dimension where there are little less contours on the surface to orient it and allow, to lie along the substrate. Whereas for high uh, fractal dimension film, it's almost impossible for film, uh, such film to stay there but horizontally oriented. Instead, it is energetically favorable for it to, to be vertically oriented like this. And we had some theoretical support as well. Uh, uh, Amit Ranjan was one of other postdoc working with Professor Sharma at this time. And he actually showed that it is indeed true that the higher the fractal dimension, the better the vertical orientation. So other example is this uh, lotus-like uh, Janus films that we developed. Uh, this was uh, work when Chandra was here, I think. So, this is this is the lotus leaf. Uh, you can see that the top surface has a, a very different microstructure as compared to uh, the lower substrate. Now the top surface for a lotus leaf that grows mostly in the muddy water, it has to have a very clean uh, surface, otherwise it will die. If the leaves are not clean, uh, it will just die. So it has to remove all the dust from the top. So it has to have a self-cleaning property as uh, initially the first presenter was explaining. So the self-cleaning property is very important. So such kind of self-cleaning properties come from uh, this functionality uh, given by roughness as well as some wax layer that sits on top of these nodules. And that gives it a uh, 
super hydrophobic and self cleaning property however the lower side that mostly remains in water uh, in contact with water it has completely different microstructure and you can see that it has a very different wetting property uh, on the top as well as the bottom side so we developed some uh, similar structures here uh, so we call them genus films uh, this is a greek god named genus it has uh, it has probably two different faces so uh, uh, depicting two different personalities of the same person so similarly we developed a film so where you can see that this is a very hydrophilic uh, uh, region so because the capillary is going up and whereas this side is completely hydrophobic because the water is pushing down so you get a positive mix here so these are similar to genus particles where they have two different uh, uh, same particle which have which has two different properties on its uh, surfaces so on one side you have contact angle of about 160 and the other side is very less so how we made this film so we did these films were made at the oil water interface so we actually grew the films in situ so again i used my phd uh, thesis knowledge uh, to grow these uh, silica films at the interface of oil and water because these films are growing at oil and water naturally what happens is that the uh, hydrophobic tails that we had uh in uh, incorporated the prtms that we have we were adding they tend to uh, grow towards uh, the heptane the oil phase because they don't like water so they tend to go away and uh, grow here so that gives a very unique wetting property uh, of the, for this films so you can see that the drops are bouncing and the drops are rolling also from this top side surface whereas as soon as the drop reaches the other side it actually gets uh, sucked in because the other side is hydrophilic so you can clearly see that it has two different uh, surface properties on top and bottom so uh, the raman spectra actually confirmed that that we had a very big uh, change in the ch intensity on the oil side surface versus oil water side surface and that actually leads to higher hydrophobicity on the water side surface uh, the oil side surface and also the microstructure was very different because the films are grow uh, the oil side surface has less access to the water and the water had the uh, catalyst to condense the silica these structures were more porous as compared to water side so the water side you can see that the structures are very dense but whereas the oil side the structures are much much porous uh, porous so that gives it another, another advantage uh, that the cassie baxter type wetting property whenever you put a drop on it there will be air pockets below the drop and that gives it uh, the unique genus uh, genus properties so this very very much looks like uh, the lotus leaf Uh, where you have more porosity on top top side of the leaf whereas less porosity at the bottom side of the leaf and this actually looks very similar so then naturally the next instinct instinct uh, experiment is to try and add some surfactant to the substrate so as soon as you add substrate uh, surfactant what these surfactants will do is that they tend to assem uh, assemble at the oil water interface depending on the concentration uh, so and the the, uh, the hydrophobic tail will orient itself towards the uh, oil side and the hydrophobic uh, hydrophilic tail or uh, the head will orient itself towards the water side and now the film will start to grow uh, at this interface at such interface where the surface energy has now uh, decreased considerably and we observe that indeed the structures are very different now you see the oil side surface is still porous but it's not that as porous as it was initially so because of the change in surface energy uh, the interfacial energy of the oil and water and the water side surface and oil side surface has slightly different microstructure 
However, the weighting properties were not that different. So if you see the uh, advancing and receding contact angle uh, for the uh, without surfactant, we had always the uh, change uh, uh, difference in the advancing and contact uh, receding contact angle almost stable at 60 degrees. Whereas with surfactant, as the surface inclination angle was increased, you can see that the change almost disappeared and it becomes almost uh, similar to what uh, it was for both uh, hydro, uh, the water side as well as oil side. This is another study that we are currently working on. Uh, we are about to publish a patent now. Uh, we are file a patent on, on this now. So this is a quite new work that we are working on. Uh, it's called Agar, uh, it's called bacterial culture dry pipe nanofiber max. So right now, all, all the uh, pathological tests that are done uh, in India or uh, almost anywhere in the world are based on agar plating. So agar plating is the most common method in practice, uh, but it needs expert handling of samples and uh, plating experience as well. The other problem with agar plating is that the, the patient has to come to lab and give, it, give the sample for let's say a urine or blood sample or saliva sample. And then they, they uh, plate those uh, samples and then they, it, it grows on the plate and then they say confirm whether you have a bacterial infection or not. So this is what is commonly done right now. So that has uh, put a severe uh, limitation on its portability and uh, access to remote locations. So as you can imagine, this plating is not very accessible for a lot of rural areas in India. So we have to do something about that. So we thought that maybe we can do a dry uh, uh, substrate. We can develop a dry substrate where we can grow bacteria easily and that should be also portable and storable. So we can, uh, since because uh, these uh, nanofiber based culture, culture mats are dry, you can actually cut them uh, into small pieces and pack them sterically and store them for a long time. And uh, it can be cultured because the sample, the patient has to just put a drop of saliva or blood on top of it and then pack it again and send it back. So it, it, is, it can be cultured by a non-expert with very less training. So this, this has a tremendous benefits if it is successful. So we try to develop these kind of maps. And I'm going to show you some results. Uh, because this is still in filing process, so I'm not going to reveal too much about the paint, the, the polymers that we used and the materials that we used. But this is somehow this is the process. So we had some biocompatible polymer and uh, some bacterial culture media, and then we spin code it, co spin it, co spin it, and make uh, this uh, fiber mat. The, once the fiber mats are made, uh, we also have. Uh, a control sample with us and then we cut it into small pieces and then we put a sample, uh, drop of uh, analyte from on top of these mats. And once we put the drop of analyte on this mat, these mats are exposed to a little bit of humidity. It's not a very uh, difficult experiment to do. You just have to put some water drops in a petri dish and put a water, uh, this, uh, put this uh, mat in the petri dish and close it. So just, just the, that humidity is enough for the bacteria, uh, for the media from the fibers to come out and allow the bacterial growth on the mat. The beauty of this method is, let's say you have a patient somewhere sitting, uh, somewhere staying in, let's say three days from here. So it takes about three days for his sample to arrive. So what we can do is we can ship the sample, these mats to him. He can uh, put his drop or drop of blood or saliva on top of these mats. And then we can give supply with the mat. We, are, we can also supply a petri dish kind of thing uh, for him to store it and ship it back. So he can ship it back. And by the time it comes to the lab, we, the bacterial culture is already done. So you just have to confirm it uh, using an expertise, uh, uh, expert in pathological lab whether the, the sample has bacteria, bacterial growth or not. 
So that is the most important aspect of this whole uh, study. So you can see that we have done uh, different uh, media. Uh, we have grown this, uh, we have added this media and the fiber look uh, very much intact. There is not much change in the change in uh, morphology of the fibers. And we confirm that the media is present using X-ray and uh, EDS uh, detection that indeed the media is everywhere. It's not only at selective places. So if the fiber can, uh, the bacteria can grow easily. The other advantage with this uh, fiber mat is that agar plate is a very two dimension surface. Whereas uh, this fiber mat is a three dimension surface. So it allows a more natural uh, way for bacteria or even cells to grow on such kind of surface. So here are some of the examples that we have seen that E. coli bacteria, uh, you can easily grow on these dry sheets. So we just expose that, uh, uh, we put a small inoculation uh, drop of these E. coli uh, bacteria on top of these uh, fibers, mats, and then expose it to humidity and allow the bacteria to grow. Of course, E. coli bacteria is very easy to grow on almost any surface, but we tested it with some other bacteria as well, and it works very fine. So this is another example just showing some microscopic images that uh, using DAPI that actually the bacteria is going and uh, as a function of time. Now this is a three dimensional as I was saying that uh, since the, the fibers are porous, it actually provides a 3D kind of uh, you know, substrate for bacteria to grow. So it, it, indeed we observe that as a function of depth, the more bacteria are growing inside the bacteria inside the film. So this is another example where this is a more practical example for uh, bacteria so where TB is one of the most threat, life threatening uh, condition in India and almost two lakh people die out of uh, because of TB every year. However, it takes more than 15 days to diagnose presence of mycobacterium on, in the agar pleating media. So it's a very time consuming process and time is, a, is the key for any treatment, treatment of any disease. The early detection is key. So in such cases, if the patient is uh, away from uh, these pathological labs, it's very difficult for him to give sample. So it takes a lot of time even to culture these uh, bacteria and confirm that, okay, indeed the person has TB or not. So such, and in such cases, this uh, culture bacteria, uh, the medium uh, can be easily shipped to him. And by the time the, the sample arrives, we will know the result already, whether the person has TB or not. So that is the beauty of this uh, method. We of course have some uh, more example, but because of lack of time, I will not go into details. Uh, Chandra will remember some of these because I have done some work with him as well on this, uh, on carbon MEMS, where we could grow cells on these uh, pattern substrates and uh, carbonized pattern substrates. This is one recent example where uh, carbon substrates were initially, uh, these are photoreis based carbon substrates. So photoreis was actually films were wrinkled and that wrinkling gives to very interesting alignment on the cell, of the cells on the surfaces. So these are our thrust areas at uh, nanoscience. Uh, so, so this is what summary is. Uh, is uh, we just looked at some of the surface functionalization methods and uh, these are obviously very important tool for designing new and new materials and devices and various physical chemical functionalization strategies also we explored. Uh, I would be happy to have any questions you have. Uh, this is acknowledgement. Some of the students that worked on these projects were Madhuparna, Gaurav and Tanya. These are my former bosses and some of the collaborators. These are the facilities that uh, where I had this access of uh, neutron scattering and uh, excess scattering. And thank you very much for your time. And thank you for listening to me so patiently. Of course, you don't have any options. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Manisham Kulkarni for your informative talk. I am also thankful to Professor Rivartha Mukherjee for inspiring us in this area. I am sure your presentations must have helped viewers to have a better insight and think in the aligned directions.
we hope all the viewers have posted their questions now we will take the viewers question one by one we will try our best to pick up the maximum questions in the available time frame take uh, sony so i think professor ravi has to leave for a